1993, 19-year-old Steve-O was a legendary partier at the University of Miami. And he'd won the heart of classmate Tracy Smith. The pair lived together their freshman year. But when they returned after summer break, things had changed. I was work hard, play hard, and he was just play hard, play harder. That was where we started growing apart. She wanted to make something of herself and um, just wanted to get drunk all the time. Fed up with Steve's lack of direction, Tracy ended the relationship. It broke my heart. It was terribly hard because we were close friends and I loved him, I still did. He took the breakup horribly. It made him insane. He started doing stupid, crazy stuff. Steve-O was willing to do anything to win Tracy back. My reaction to it was to uh, go around and start jumping off of apartment buildings into shallow pools. I wanted Tracy Smith to worry about me. Things that he was doing weren't little average um, stunts. A lot of rappelling down from 15-story dormitory rooms it was scary to watch. I was doing a lot of dangerous stuff, and I was doing it while drunk and even, like, on LSD. I was terrified. I thought he was going to kill himself. Steve-O dropped out of college, and over the next two years, his stunts became even more dangerous. All these crazy stunts started out as expression of my pain from this breakup with Tracy Smith. As I was doing it, I thought, man, like this, I really like was passionate about it. And I came up with the idea to become a stuntman. But one January night in 1995, it seemed he'd pushed his luck too far. I was drunk on this balcony at this party, and I told this girl how I was going to be a great stuntman. And a picture if I was there was a fight scene. And then I'd get hit, and I was trying to act it out like, and so I went drunk over this railing. Landed on my face on the concrete. I wasn't so much as twitching a finger. We were really scared. There was a pool of blood gathering around his head. Everybody had to have assumed that I was dead. 911 was dialed immediately. I broke my cheekbone, I broke seven teeth, I had 10 stitches in my chin, and a broken wrist. He, he barely looked human, he looked like a smurf. But hours later, Steve-O proved that it takes more than broken bones to keep him from a party. He had broken out of the hospital. I was in the gown with my butt sticking out and uh, went right back to where the party was and tried to drink a beer on the very spot where I landed on my face. His college friends might have been impressed by Steve-O's resilience. But by 1996, the life of the party was wearing out his welcome. He didn't pay rent, he didn't contribute to the beer. He was a mooch. I was an irresponsible, unmotivated slob who couldn't keep a job. I reached a dead end. Steve needed a place to live and he needed to start over. In July of 1996, Steve-O's sister offered him both when she invited him to stay in her Albuquerque apartment. There, he was introduced to a magazine that would change his life. Big Brother was just the most outrageous thing I'd ever seen, man. Well, it was a skateboarding magazine that really... It was more about the uh, cast of characters they had working there and all the naughty things they could think up. You know, I just wanted to, to be in Big Brother magazine. Steve-O immediately set out to capture Big Brother's attention. He sent tape after tape of these stunts and apparently drove them crazy enough until they actually said, OK, we need to meet this guy. On a promotional tour in May of 1997, Big Brother paid a visit to Albuquerque. I just informed them that I was going to be in their magazine. That whether they liked me or not did not matter, that I was going to do something so awesome. He wanted to light his hair on fire, and this pro skateboarder, Chris Markovich, was supposed to blow the fireball off his head. With Big Brother watching, Steve-O's hair was set on fire while Markovich approached with a mouthful of rubbing alcohol. Markovich came kind of from the wrong angle. Sprayed the rubbing alcohol kind of from this direction instead of this direction. Instead of blowing it off his head, he blows it right into his face and melts Steve-O's face off. I'm just scrambling through this backyard trying to put out the flames. Finally get his hair out. He's blistered pretty bad. His face was burnt really bad. 
Stevo suffered second-degree burns and was fortunate that the damage wasn't even more extensive. But he didn't seem to care. All that mattered was that his fiery fiasco made it into the pages of Big Brother. For the very first time, Stevo's stunts were actually getting exposure. That's when really it started, you know, when he became a correspondent. He would always call Jeff and just talk to him and insist in, you know, ideas for articles. There's no way I was going to shake this guy. He was committed to getting his fame. And after the Big Brother team took him under their wing, he was anxious to take his skills to the next level. My sister found out about Ringling Brothers Barnum & Bailey Clown College. You know, if I could graduate from that, this would bring legitimacy to all of my crazy antics with my flips and my fire, and, and it would further my goal of becoming a stuntman. In July of 1997, Steve-O traveled to Sarasota, Florida to begin the grueling eight-week program. We had 14-hour days broken up into hour-long classes, dance, improv, clowning, acrobatics, makeup. He was learning the technical ways to do stunts without hurting yourself. He completed clown school and returned to Albuquerque. But a career under the big top would have to wait. On the night of October 10th, 1998, Steve-O and his sister received devastating news. I got a phone call. Your mom, she's had a brain hemorrhage. She's not expected to survive the night. You guys need to come now. Steve and Cindy rushed to their mother's bedside. She's had this look on her face that was really, uh, that really still haunts me, kind of. Um, it, was, it was clearly bad, man. You know, mom never, uh, would never be the same. Donna survived the brain aneurysm, but was left physically and mentally disabled. Steve and Cindy relocated to Florida to care for their mother. Steve was so determined to make her laugh as much as possible. Um, and he would tell her stories. And even though she wasn't all there, she was there. She was in there. Mm, I love you so much, Mom. In Boca Raton, Steve focused his energies on his ailing mother, and for the first time, he set his high-wire stunts aside. But soon enough, his big brother buddies would bring the daredevil back into action. And this time, it would be on a far bigger stage. 